is the day today the day that the lord has made we will rejoice and we will be glad in it we have a whole library of suggested scriptures in this morning's lectionary beginning in the book of exodus the children of israel again we visit them in the wilderness and again they're experiencing a shortage this time of water and they complain uh did you bring us out here to kill us moses and moses uh goes to god he says what am i going to do with these people and god gives him a solution and of course he says take some of the elders and and um go to the um uh, go to with your staff and uh, strike uh the one that you used to strike the Nile and go to the rock uh, at Horeb and strike the rock and the water will come out of it. And so they named the place uh, Masa and Meribah uh, because they quarreled there and tested the Lord asking this question, is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? That seems to be a a question that people will ask frequently throughout the course of their lives. Often, it's at a time of adversity or uncertainty. It's at a time when we are really wondering, has God abandoned us? Uh, is God here? Is God caring? Is God uh, adjudicating my choices? Uh, where is God in the midst of all of this? So today, we want to check in with prayer, and I invite you to join me. Heavenly Father, today, um, we may or may not be asking the question, are you among us? Are you here? Are you present? Are you aware? Are you in your role as our uh, advocate through the Holy Spirit? Are you uh, speaking to us? And are you speaking for us? And we pray today that we would be aware of your presence and that we would trust in your presence, that we would trust in your love, in your grace, in your mercy, in your power. We uh, gather all our prayers together and we pray together. Uh, in the words of Jesus, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and forever. Amen. Well, the psalmist is so impressed with this account that he writes about it in Psalm 78 and asks for renewal uh, among the people. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the word of my mouth. That's Psalm 78. I will open my mouth in a parable, in a story. I'll utter dark sayings from old. Um, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children, and we will tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might. And he recounts this time in the wilderness when the rock was split and the streams came out of water. If we take a look at our spiritual history and the history of generations of seeking God and rejecting God and repenting and coming back to God and changing our minds over and over and over again, forgetting God and neglecting God and abandoning God and then returning to God. And God is always present among us. Ezekiel is uh, speaking in uh, chapter 18 of his prophetic book, and the word of God comes to Ezekiel, 
And God says, I want the people to stop saying that uh, their problems and their judgments are to be blamed on their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents and on all, all the generations. And they had a saying for it. It was the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on age, on, on edge. As I live, this parable shall no more be used in Israel. And then the word comes through Ezekiel. Listen, everybody's got to bear their own burden. If someone does something worthy of uh, judgment and death, it's on them. It's, it's really only based on what they've done, their decisions, their choices, what they have done. And then God speaks from God's own heart and says, um, get rid of all your transgressions that you've committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. There's a personal choice to be made. Each generation must make a choice, and each person who is a member of that generation must make a choice. The epistle reading takes us to the book of Philippians and takes us to heaven where Jesus himself, the Son of God, makes a choice. And Paul says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit and compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard each, uh, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not on your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let this same mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to take that last sentence and circle it in our consciousness today. Let the mind of Christ be in us. Well, that is a decision itself. That is an act of volition where we decide to think like Jesus. So, so much of what we do begins with what we think and how we think and the choice we make with regard to believing and perceiving and putting on a different set of lenses through which we view life and the world and through which we ask the big questions like, is God with us? And we are willing to look around and see the presence of God among us. What was this mind that Jesus had that we can decide to let be in us? Well, he was in the form of God, but did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. I like that translation that the NRSV has uh, that I think uh, is not as clear from its original in some of the other translations. Jesus did not exploit his unique position and relationship with God, but he emptied himself. He took the form of a slave and uh, was born in human likeness and found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as, if, as you have ob always obeyed me, uh, not only my presence, but uh, much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Again, we come to that whole concept of personal responsibility 
that idea that we have to make decisions and those choices that we make lead to action and a lifestyle of action. And that which has been worked into us, that which has been given to us freely, our salvation, we're to uh, knead into our lives. That's K-N-E-A-D, like you knead the bread. I, I kneaded some uh, butter into some almond flour yesterday to make some almond flour biscuits. And uh, uh, I'm not sure it was exactly kneading, but, you know, I was pressing it in. I was working it in. And so we work in that which has been worked into our lives and so that it can be worked out and it can flavor the whole biscuit of our lives. But aware that yes, God is present in this and the presence of God is working and willing his good pleasure in us. Now, all this brings us to the gospel and I believe it is in the gospel that we'll find the deepest meaning for the day and the deepest answer to the question is God with us and what is our personal response, response and responsibility in this matter. And as was often brought up as a subject, who goes first into the kingdom of God and who, who lags along? And we're in the final chapters of Matthew and the final chapters of Jesus' ministry on earth when uh, Jesus is in the temple. Now, he's in the temple after having already come to the temple at a previous occasion and overturning the temples. Uh, the tables of the money changers and those who interrupted the worship of the world. Uh, they were sitting in the in the uh, place that was the court of the Gentiles, where Gentiles would come to worship. And the, these were people who were a part of a system that uh, was very much uh, tied to the fact that they were in an occupied country. They were changing money from uh, the national currencies of the nations, uh, probably a lot of Roman currency, into uh, currency uh, that was um, that was acceptable in the temple, and uh, and they were in cahoots uh, with uh, Rome. In fact, everybody had to be in cahoots with Rome for their own protection. The, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the high priests, the scribes. All of those folks had created uh, alliances that mainly the idea was not to upset the Romans so they would come in and do what they inevitably did in, the, in AD 70, 40 years later, uh, when they came and destroyed the temple. They were always living in fear of uh, what the Romans might do. The Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, could have easily become the sword of Rome. And so they ended up taking advantage of the people, the people uh, of uh, Israel, the people who deeply desired to worship, the people who deeply desired to follow the ways of God, who were looking for redemption, who were looking for restoration of the temple, who were looking for restoration of the life of uh, the community of faith and the pe and the covenant, uh, the people. There were always uh, folks who were um, over the people and manipulating the people and profiting from the people and carried away with their own power. And yet, at the same time, they were the experts. They were the ones who uh, supposedly believed most deeply and thought most deeply on spiritual things. They were the protectors of the heritage. They were people like, you know, people who've been in my position, people who are so tempted to uh, lord it over others because we have uh, positions of a spiritual authority and power. And oftentimes we're, the greatest temptation is to abuse that. And so Jesus comes to the temple and in an act that is uh, 
a prophetic uh, unveiling of what Malachi said, the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant who ye delight in. And so he comes to the temple as if he were occupying the temple and taking over. Uh, and at least for this brief period of time, he becomes the center of attention in the temple as he teaches and proclaims the kingdom of God has come. And as he knits together the threads of history, and as he uh, explains uh, in uh, his own action and deed his relationship to the prophetic words of John the Baptist and John the Baptist's uh, prophetic connection to the prophet Elijah and the traditions that Elijah will come first before the Messiah. He doesn't talk much about being the Messiah, but he acts so much like a Messiah the anointed one, the appointed one, the one to come and restore the life of the people of the covenant to usher in and to announce the kingdom of God. Is God among us or not? God's among us and the kingdom is among us and the kingdom has come and there is a great showdown coming. And how many times in our lives, personally, as we apply this, as we uh, live or die for our own sins or choices, as we choose to step down from that place where we exploit our special relationship with God, where we decide to follow the way of the kingdom and the way of Jesus and to trust in him and to believe in him and to uh, believe his promises, knowing what we know and, and believing somewhere inside of us what we believe, whether we will intentionally believe or intentionally disbelieve. It's not a matter of being convinced at that point. It's a matter of deciding. He comes to the temple and there's a confrontation coming. And verse 24 of Matthew 21 says that the uh, chief priests and the elders came to him as he was teaching and asked, this is verse 23, actually, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? That was their big interest. They were more interested in authority than anything else. Well, who gave them their authority? Well, in some cases, uh, and, and to some extent, it was tradition, it was relationship, it was, it was their heritage, and it but Jesus questions their authority. And to some extent, uh, Rome had granted uh, authority to the leaders to administer uh, their religious practices with the understanding that they would never disturb the Pax Romana. They would never disturb the peace. They wouldn't rock the boat. And here comes Jesus rocking the boat. And their question is, who authorized you to do that? And his question uh, was uh, clear. And the, the question was, had a life or death answer to it. Uh, are you going to declare what you've been implying so that we can bring you up on charges and put you to death? You know, anybody can go out on the streets in our time and say whatever they are want about themselves, and they can claim any authority, and they can speak for God, and they'll be ridiculed in many cases, but if you spoke for God and you weren't really speaking for God in that time, it could bring about the penalty of death. Now, they wanted enough evidence to charge him and convict him and to get him out of the way because he was rocking the boat. He was threatening their authority and he was threatening their safety. He was threatening their power. He was threatening the stability. In some ways, you have to say they were doing their job. In other ways, you have to understand they really didn't understand <laughs> what their job was. Is God among us or not? Well, they chose not to see that. It was very important how Jesus would answer the question. They had him locked in. He, he could lie and say, I'm not, knowing that he was. 
or he could tell the truth and be immediately arrested before his work was done and have his work interrupted. So Jesus said, I'll ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, I'll tell you about what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? Well, there was a stumping question. It was so stumping that they, you know, they called in their cards. They argued with each other. They said, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, why didn't you believe him? You see, they could have believed him. And their belief would have resulted in action. And repentance, like so many who went to John in the wilderness and repented. They, that word for repentance that was used around John's ministry and that Jesus used had to do with the change of mind, a change of heart. Let this mind be in you. Let your mind change about the things of God. Let your mind change with regard to the question, is God among us or not? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. It does bring to question, where did they get their authority? Did some of it come from God or from the system? Did some of it come from Rome? And then how about the people? See, the same people that are afraid of human authorities are also afraid of the people. Read the history of the Roman uh, Republic and the Roman Empire and the, the background of Rome, kings and emperors could be overthrown. They could be assassinated. You see, whenever you rule over a people, whether you're a dictator or not, some of it is bluff. No matter how many stormtroopers you have out there suppressing and oppressing the people, what they're doing is creating fear. And so the authorities want a situation where your fear of them is greater than their fear of you in any oppressive system. Fear is a factor. And so don't forget that the leaders are as afraid of the people as people are of them. There's a certain amount of bluff. Who can bluff the best? I mean, really, they've got swords and guns, too, and they've got the ability to bring great suffering. But they have even greater ability to create fear. But these people are afraid of the crowd. They don't want to lose their position. It's fragile. So they answered Jesus. Brilliant answer. Even though they knew the answer they would not own it. They would not, they would not take responsibility for it. We don't know. So Jesus said, neither will I tell you what, by what authority I'm doing these things. Now, he part of the text and be the shortest one, probably. What do you think? There's the parable coming. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not, but he later changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said to the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he didn't go. Which of these two did the will of the father? Well, they said the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. Who goes first? For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, even after you had the evidence, even after you could be convinced, you did not change your minds and believe in him. You didn't let the mind be in you. That was in Christ. You didn't think, change your thinking. You refused to believe. It was intentional unbelief. It wasn't honest doubt. It was intentional unbelief. 
you saw what happened and you chose not to believe and to do. One group preconditioned to do the will of God, openly committed to do the will of God, openly aligned with the things of God, having declared God is among us as a policy. Religious folks like many of us, clergy like many of us, people of a heritage like many of us. The elder son is from one of Jesus' other stories, the one who's been with him, aligned with him. But when the call to repent, the call to believe, the call to put our money where our mouth is, the call to really stand up for truth, the call to turn from our wicked ways, the call to embrace the kingdom of God and a new level of trust and a new Lord. When that comes to us, when that opportunity comes to us to realize that our teeth are set on edge by our own sour grapes, not the sour grapes that our parents ate. The time, the opportunity to take responsibility for our own sins and for our own receiving of the grace and the mercy of God. When that comes, and either through volition or through uh, neglect, we refuse to go into the vineyard, to take that step of faith, to step out and to join the army, to join the God movement, we refuse. And then the people who are maligned because of their allegiances, the people who have, who have perpetrated the unpopular sins or the disreputable sins, the more obvious sins, the sins that we are more comfortable criticizing than our own, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the con artists, the thieves, the people we don't like, the people whose sins disgust us more than other people's sins. When those people hear that message of repentance from John and then from Jesus, they hear it as a message of hope. They hear it as a message of love. They hear it as a message of redemption. They hear it as a message of reconciliation they hear god is among us and he is calling us and he is accepting us and he's changing us he's giving us a new opportunity he's inviting us into his kingdom and they go first they've been forgiven much and they love much and they trust much and they follow so enthusiastically The rest of ourselves of us maybe delude ourselves into thinking, well, we've been here all along. We're the early comers to the kingdom. But we missed something. We've missed some of the the wonder of it and the childlike trust of it. And here's Jesus in the temple, and they're out to get him. And that time is coming when he will answer the question that they asked. And, but he'll answer it in court. And he'll say, when he knows he can be convicted, but it will be the culmination of his choice that he made in eternity to empty himself and to not do what the leaders were doing, exploiting a relationship with the Father, empty himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It's not what your mouth says when it's easy. It's what your body and life does when it's hard. But it's the road 
to glory. It gets you on the right track to where God is taking you. And it's hopeful. And it's opportunity. And when he calls to come, what you got to do is not just say yes with your mouth, but believe in your heart intentionally that God has raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and to be gracious unto you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.